Listen, when we want to make something memorable or we want to capture the imagination, friends, we tell stories. There's something about a story that, that helps engage us. It helps us see the, new, uh, the world, if you will, in new and in fresh ways. Uh, when parents want to introduce their children to the idea of perhaps not wholeheartedly trusting everyone they meet, you don't let them sit down and watch the evening news with you. You tell them a story, perhaps of the gingerbread man. Stories help us question our, our assumptions in the world. They, they help us pass on life lessons. I remember as a teenager, I was driving at a friend of mine in the passenger seat. We were at an intersection. I was preparing to turn left, and an oncoming vehicle was signaling right. And so anticipating, of course, they would need to slow down to make that turn, I confidently turned in front of them. We uh, avoided an accident, barely. Uh, and my friend got an uncomfortably close look at the grill work of the oncoming vehicle. And uh, when his, uh, the whites of his eyes had kind of finally come back down to normal, he turned to me. I'll never forget what he said. He said, a flashing signal light never made a car turn. <laughs> I, I learned assumptions that I was taking for granted. And as my children are on the cusp of starting to think about taking driver's ed, that is a story I'm sure they will hear more than once. We don't really outgrow stories either as adults. They continue to be arguably our favorite part of, of family gatherings, part of what we remember from our time together with people. Stories not only engage our minds, they, they somehow motivate and capture our hearts. And I wonder, friends, if this isn't why we find Jesus so seldom preaching exegetical sermons, but so often telling stories. The kingdom of heaven is like. Helps us see the world in new and fresh ways. Friends, the Bible is a wonderful, unique, captivating, and somewhat confusing book. And if I asked you which of those four words best describes your experience with the Bible, not only do I expect all four of those categories would probably be represented, many of you would say all of the above. It's, it's just true. That's kind of our experience with the Bible. The Bible is awkward to read. It's awkward because it's a collection of books from a collection of time periods in a variety of genres, and it's really easy to kind of lose the story in the midst of the many stories. I and mean, you try to read the Bible historically, but it's not laid out chronologically. And we try to read it devotionally, but let's be honest, if it was strictly for devotional purposes, we would arrange it differently and we'd probably throw out at least half. And I'm not saying that just to be funny. You know if you have devotional guides, about half of the Bible never makes it into those. There's a reason for that. <laughs> the Bible isn't laid out like a, a systematic theology textbook. It, it certainly doesn't read like a science uh, manual or essay. The Bible comes to us first and foremost in the form of a story. And as it does so, it invites us to engage with life-shaping questions that I suspect everybody wrestles with in some way, shape, or form. Who am I? Where did I come from? What's wrong with the world? What makes things right? How should I live? Where is history going? What happens when we die? And, and for this reason, amongst others, we want to spend the next five weeks as we enter this year kind of just telling or talking about what we're going to just call the story of God. We want to break the Bible down into kind of five key chapters and just kind of walk through them. Uh, and, and we'll do this for three reasons. I think there's value in this for three reasons. The first is this, and I alluded to this already. It's easy to lose the story of Scripture in the midst of the many stories. And so I hope this helps us just kind of appreciate the, the, the narrative arc, if you will, of Scripture once again. And I hope, uh, as a result, this makes the Bible a little less threatening to us. And so that as we pick it up, we have an idea, depending where we're reading, of how this fits into the story. Second reason is I hope this helps us speak with greater clarity about our faith. Uh, if you recall, and our BLESS acronym from this fall is still on our stage, uh, our BLESS acronym was designed to just remind us of five, kind of five habits or behaviors, ways that we can be living our faith out loud. And I won't refresh our mind at this moment on all of them, but the last one is what? Help me out. Story. We kind of said as opportunities become acquaintances and acquaintances become friendships, one of the realities is we get to learn the stories of others, but there becomes opportunities come up for us to share our story. And so I hope as we talk through this, you become a little bit, you have a greater awareness of how your story 
connects with God's story. And it gives you some of the tools to speak a little bit more confidently and perhaps with greater clarity as a result. And, and lastly, and I think perhaps most importantly, friends, this is not about more information. It's primarily an invitation for us to join in. I have news for you. God's story isn't done. And while it baffles me a little bit, it seems he delights to co-author many of these chapters in partnership with us. And so I hope this isn't just information you take in, although I hope there's some stuff perhaps we learn. I hope this allows us to have greater passion to step into and live into God's story. Does that make sense? I should maybe give you a quick summary of where we're going. Uh, we're going to break the story down into five sections. I was reading an article in Christianity Today not that long ago. It's pretty common when you look at story of God narrative for people to kind of do four chapters. It will go creation, kind of where did we come from, who are we? We'll talk about the fall, what's wrong with the world. A lot of stories jump from there to Jesus, what makes things right. And the reason why we're not going to do that is it asks the question, then why do we bother with our Old Testament at all? If we're going to jump straight from Genesis chapter 3 to Matthew chapter 1, why do we have the Old Testament at all? And so we want to take a week to talk about Israel and the role that Israel plays in God's story. We'll get to Jesus, what makes things right. And of course, we'll wrap up towards the end with kind of some of the last chapters of Revelation. We'll talk about recreation and kind of the trajectory that we believe human history is on. Make sense? So today we are in Genesis chapter 2, friends. If you have your Bibles, please turn there with me. And while you're turning to Genesis chapter 2, maybe allow me to make a few general comments about some of the opening chapters that we find in this book. If for any reason you are not familiar with where Genesis is, I have good news for you. It's the very first book in your Bible. And if you just kind of wet your finger and start turning pages, you'll find it in short order. We're not 100% sure who wrote Genesis, Although long-standing Jewish tradition will suggest Moses is the primary author of the first five books of the Bible. And so we, we accept this, that it is likely that Moses, borrowing from a variety of ancient sources, both oral, and if you think about a story of human origins, we're dating back to long before there, were, there was even writing, much less iPhones to like capture the moment. So oral history, as well as borrowing from ancient written sources, is likely the person that compiled this for us. I'm going to try to keep our conversation largely on the broad ideas of the story of Scripture as opposed to all of the details and questions we might want to pose of the early chapters of Genesis. Having said that, one of the things that I find helpful to remember is this. The questions that you and I as modern readers tend to bring to the text are not as important to the ancient world. They, 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 they Worried more about different ones. Tanya, if you fire the next slide, I'll just explain it this way. When you and I come to a story of human origin, what's our first question? We want to know what happened and how it happened. Talk to me about the process. And preferably, the more detail I get, the happier I am. And if you can write it in scientific, quantifiable terms, I'm even happier. The ancient world's not as interested in process. What they're interested in is purpose. They are more interested to know who did this and why did they do it. Because if we understand that, we have a sense of how we relate or step into that story. And as a, as, an, as a statement, I realize this doesn't answer questions or it may just make you more frustrated. I just find it helpful to acknowledge at the outset that a lot of times when I'm reading Genesis, what I wish it would tell me is just not what the author is interested in communicating. And so we should just be honest about that up front. And so with that said, I might just summarize again just... The opening chapters of Genesis don't really read like a history. They certainly don't read like a science. Uh, they have elements in common with mythology, and I know that worries people because it implies that I, I think it's not true, and that's not what I'm saying. Mythology in the ancient world is just how you talk about the concept of God. And, and so it really shouldn't threaten us that there's similarities. But it's not myth in that regard, but it doesn't, and it doesn't list like a, a list of God's attributes. It's not purely theology. It comes to us in the beautiful form of story. And this is also partly what frustrates us, because most of us wish it was one of these other categories. It's not how it comes. It comes as a story. But I want to suggest to you, powerfully, it still tells us truth about God. And I have this on great confidence, and I would say it this way, because Jesus himself endorses this. And here's where a small rabbit trail is perhaps in order. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. At, after Jesus rises from the dead, he appears to a variety of different people in different 
settings and situations. One of these situations, uh, the story happens in Luke chapter 24, and there's two disciples who are walking from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus, and, and, and Jesus appears and he's walking with them. They don't recognize him. They're lamenting. They're trying to process the sense that Jesus has been crucified. His tomb is empty. They don't know what to do with this. And in Luke 24, and I believe it's verse 17, Jesus has one of these wonderful sentences. It says this, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And if you're like me, I tend to read over this a little bit too quickly. Jewish scriptures were primarily categorized into two, two groupings. The, the law, the first five books of the Bible, which we just said were written by who? Moses. And the prophets was the second category. So when, if a Jew wanted to refer to all of their scripture, this is how they would say it the law and the prophets, or Moses and the prophets. And so Jesus takes Moses and the prophets and all of the Jewish scriptures and starts to unpack how they tell God's story and how they point people to him. This isn't the only time Jesus makes this reference, but it's one of those wonderful statements, which is why we, we feel as confident as we do about what the Old Testament tells us about God, because Jesus himself said, yeah, it does. With that said, let's jump into our story today. Genesis chapter 2, I'm just going to read a few verses kind of in sections here and I'll, I'll pause to make a few comments along the way. Genesis chapter 2, I'm going to pick up at verse 4 here. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. I love how our author sets up the need. He, I'm paraphrasing here, but he essentially says this. There's no food growing in uncultivated areas of the earth, and there's no one to cultivate the areas that could grow food. What do we need? We need someone. And, and at this moment, God steps in and he creates. Now, remember, our author is more interested in purpose than process. We're not given a lot of detail about process. He talks about dust forming. I don't know how you form dust. Have you ever tried to form dust? There might have been other ingredients. We, we simply don't know. What I think our author doesn't want us to miss is the who. And one of the beautiful pictures in this particular passage, and I'm going to assume a degree of familiarity with Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1 and 2, we get two, two accounts of creation, and they overlap. They kind of focus on slightly different things. In Genesis chapter 1, how does God create? Do you remember? He, he, it says that he speaks. At, at his command, things spring into being, right? So he, chapter 1 gives us this picture of this powerful, sovereign creator who from a great distance can go, and stuff happens. But not in chapter 2. When God comes to create man, he doesn't create him from a, a relational distance. It, it's, the, the picture is almost as if he gets down on his hands and knees and he plays in the dirt if a spirit has hands to play in the dirt, right? But it's a picture. God gets up close and personal in the creation of humanity. And that's a beautiful, beautiful picture. I think our author would want to make sure that we know the following, which means what? You and I are not an accident. There's purpose. Not a result of cosmic chance. Divine purpose said, I will create. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and from there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. gold. The gold of that land is good. Is there not good gold? I don't know. 
Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. One of the strong undercurrents, images, that is evoked throughout the creation account, and uh, quite a few commentators will draw this out. They will draw it out in much greater detail than I will. I'm just going to lay it out here for your consideration. This is that God is creating the world and the cosmos, not just as a, a habitation for humanity. He's creating it as a sanctuary for himself. Uh, the, the image is that of the building of a temple where God's presence will come to dwell. Uh, at least in part, this is the picture of the seventh day, the Sabbath day, which we didn't read here. It's part of the first story. But what happens on the seventh day? God Right, he rests. Is that because God's so exhausted from creating that he needs a nap? Well, I, I couldn't say with certainty, but probably not. You and I might need a nap. God probably doesn't. The, the word picture is of a, having finished creating a sanctuary for his presence. God comes and he rests. He moves in. He takes up residence in this place. It's this wonderful picture that we probably shouldn't miss. Uh, and we'll talk about this more in the coming weeks. In the meantime, uh, the word Eden comes from a Hebrew term. It means pleasure or delight. God has created space, if you will, where you and I, humanity, can flourish and enjoy relationship with our Creator. Now, what's interesting to me is that we often refer to this place as the Garden of Eden, and I, that's not incorrect, by the way, but if you, I don't know if you noticed this in verse 10. It says, a river flowed from Eden and watered the garden. You catch that? And what it infers, if I could use maybe an analogy, it's in the same way that a palace garden adjoins a palace, it's likely that the Garden of Eden simply adjoins a broader area that we might call Eden. In fact, the implication is that God's presence specifically dwells in Eden and that right next, he has created a place where you and I will also share that proximity. It's, it's really a wonderful picture. When you and I read about the four rivers, if I can just uh, meander for a little bit, what's our first question? We, our first, I, I bet you our first question is, so how, where is this place? We, we want to Google map it. Right? It's, 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 uh, the problem is we only know a handful of these rivers. Most of the territories there we don't recognize, and so we're left to speculate indefinitely. What I want to suggest to you is, again, our author's not interested in process as much as he is in purpose. And, and he's trying to evoke a picture, and I'll give you an example of this. If I ask, where is your house located, I'm asking for directions. Right? I, give me a Google map reference. I want to come to your house. But if I tell you, your house is strategically located... I'm not asking for directions now. I'm making a comment about the unique situation or placement of your house. I want to suggest to you the author of Genesis is more interested in helping us understand the unique placement of the Garden of Eden than he is in helping us find its location. What are we told? A river flows from Eden to water the garden. From there, it splits into four, and it moves out to the rest of the earth. I believe our author wants us to understand that all life, all life emanates. It flows from God. It flows from God to his creation and to the corners of the earth. He is far more interested in us understanding the strategic location of Eden than specifically how we might be able to Google map our way there. And I'm not ignoring the two trees, for those of you that will get a little bit concerned here. It's just those features so importantly in the story that we're going to get to next week. I'm just going to save that conversation for then. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Let me just talk about the first verse. It might interest you to know that the two verbs, to work and take care of, God says, you're going to work and take care of the land. Do you know what they're most often used to refer to throughout the Old Testament? Service that human beings offer to God. They are most often used to speak of what the, the work that priests do at the temple. And again, don't miss this. It's as if they're saying when... You, it's not just an agricultural task to till soil. As we care for creation, we offer a form of worship to God. 
It's a sacred task in sacred space that God has created. Make no mistake about this. Work is not a punishment for sin. We sometimes feel that way. But it's not. It is a gift from God. Let's move to the final verses here. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. There's a job for you. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, and if you notice this in your Bibles, it's poetry. Adam can't help himself. There's a reason why men to this day, when they fall in love, have a tendency to wax poetic. Even if the poetry's bad, they can't help themselves. It dates all the way back to the beginning. Adam says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Violets are red. Violets aren't red. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And the, the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is the first time in all creation God declares that something isn't good which always is kind of jarring, right? What? It's not good for you to be alone. And what's really interesting is God, it's as if God intentionally waits until Adam is ready to appreciate the gift. Because God could have just made woman, but he doesn't. Adam goes through this whole process of naming all of the creatures. And at the end, like you, you can see, like you can almost feel the wheels turning. A little. Something's not, just, how come I don't have? And at this point, God steps in, and it's literally like a picture of a wedding ceremony where God steps in and he gives the bride away. And Adam can't help himself, like I said. He he waxes poetic at this point. I want to just comment briefly. Uh, God creates a helper suitable. These two words over, over centuries have sometimes been used to promote man's dominance or leadership or superiority over woman. And I don't want to rabbit trail too far, but a handful of comments are perhaps in order. First off, one of the reasons these verses are a little awkward to interpret, you and I understand in English language when we put two words together, sometimes they mean more than just the sum of the parts. But the two words that are put together here in Hebrew that we translate suitable and helper aren't found in con- connected like that anywhere else in the Old Testament. So we don't have any context. All we can do is, is look at the two. And so here's where I just want to make a couple of comments. The first is on the word helper. And this will, did you know that the word helper occurs 19 times in the Old Testament? Of 16, 16 out of 19 of these times, almost all, do you know who is referred to as the helper? God. When you and I talk about a helper, it implies one who is inferior. It's just kind of our culture. We talk about a teacher and a teacher's Right? There's, there's, there's the teacher, and then, well, it's the helper. In our culture, we do this. But if God is, the primary, is primarily referred to throughout the Old Testament as a helper, we should be very careful about making this kind of an inference. It's just not there. Uh, the other comment I'll make briefly is this. In, in the ancient world, the act of naming someone or something was a form of taking up a, a, a posture of, I don't want to say dominance, but you would rule. There was a sense that you had authority to oversee this. This is what Adam is doing when he names the animals. God is in fact inviting him as his image bearer to begin stepping into this responsibility to rule and care for creation. And by naming the animals, this is precisely what Adam is doing. What I simply want to suggest is, and, and I'm not going to give you a language lesson here, and I think Not every commentary would agree, but the grammar and the syntax where he says this is woman is completely different than where he is naming the animals. And it is less likely that he is naming her here, and it is far more likely he is categorizing her. You will be called woman, for you were taken from man. You will be understood in your relationship. You belong to the species of human being, I think is what I'm trying to say, is the implication of what Adam is saying here. 
So again, that won't answer all our questions, but it's a little bit of a rabbit trail just so that we understand a few things. We need to move a little bit towards application. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever tweaked your back? The back is not something we generally ever talk about or refer to until it's not right. And at that point, we suddenly become almost surprised that it affects everything. Mundane tasks that we take for granted, suddenly we don't. And like simple things like sleeping, if, you, if you've tweaked your back, sleeping's an issue. Getting up and down from the table is an issue. Trying to get in and out of the shower is an issue. Trying to tie your shoe is an issue. And these, these are not complicated tasks. They're just things we take for granted. If I could suggest the following, I want to say that the opening chapters of Genesis paint us a picture of alignment of how everything was designed to function as it was intended, best and perfectly, in symmetry. And here I'm, I'm summarizing, but we're given this wonderful picture of relational peace between God and between humanity. That God has created the world as a place for his presence to dwell and has placed an opportunity for us to share that with him. There's this wonderful picture of, of relational peace and harmony between people, humanity, and creation. That it's not just agriculture that we do. There's a sense that there's a, in the same way that the world is shaped as sacred space, the opportunity we have to care and to step into our responsibility as God's representatives, his image bearers on earth, is sacred service. It's an act of worship as we step in to the role that God has asked us to play. And there's this wonderful picture of relational intimacy between people. Now, we read the words naked and unashamed, and I find they jar me a little bit. Maybe it's because we live in a fairly lewd culture. But our first inclination on that subject is to cover up. And it's a good thing. It'd be really weird if we didn't. But what captivates me about the picture is the sense that these two people have nothing to hide from each other. That sense of openness and transparency. Think for just a minute, if you can, because we take this for granted, how often we are managing and massaging our profile and image to people around us today. How much time do we... You don't have to be on social media to do this. We do this in our homes. Well, my kids can know this about me, but I, they shouldn't know this. And my wife uh, can do this here, but I hope she doesn't find out about that. How many, how many times do we do this? It permeates our entire lives. And there's this wonderful picture, uh, almost uh, of naive innocence, that just, where we would talk, they would say, does not compute. Open trust with nothing to hide. It's this wonderful picture of alignment. And, and you don't need me to tell you that clearly this is not the reality we're living in today. But this is the story of where we come from and how we were created to function best. What do we do with this? Application is a little bit awkward, I find, but I want to talk a little bit about not only where do we come from, but who are we? One of those fundamental kind of identity questions. If you remember this from the past fall, we spent uh, two to three Sundays, I want to say, talking a little bit about identity, and I'll jog your memory this way. There's a few things we said here. One of the things we said is you and I will always behave or act out of what we most deeply believe. What we really believe, we tend to live out. And so we talked about that we're called to love because God has loved us. He's given us that, that part of his identity. We serve because we've been served by Jesus. It's a sense of our identity. And it's not something we psych ourselves up to do. It's something we need to believe more deeply so that it moves in and through us. Now, I, I think our culture is probably as confused as it ever has been on the subject of identity. And our culture will suggest that you and I should define ourselves. And it, I'm not trying to over try to make something that is nuanced and layered, over simple. But I want to say this. If there is a God, if there is a creator, perhaps your and my identity is less something we need to make up for ourselves and more something we need to rediscover and claim from the one who has gifted it to us. 
And so let me just leave you with three things, and you hopefully know these already. But never forget, friends, when it comes to a sense of identity, you are very good. What does God pronounce essentially over all of his creation in like through the first five days of Genesis chapter one? It was, it was good, it was good, it was good, oh, it was good, it was good, it was very good. God's like, I outdid myself. This is nice. He's referring to you and to me. You and I are deeply loved. I, I, again, I, I go back to that picture and the way our author tells the story of God almost getting down on his hands and knees up close and intimate with those he's about to breathe the breath of life into. You cannot behave your way out of God's love. That doesn't mean God approves of everything you do. We tend to make that next connection. That's not true. But you and I are deeply loved, and you and I can never behave our way out of that. And lastly, and we'll come to this more, or we'll park here more in, in coming weeks. While God gifts all creatures with the breath of life, he only gifts one category as his image bearers, which means you and I have a sense of divine purpose to life, meaning that that's almost, I want to say, there, there are pregnant possibilities in each day that we live and in each moment that we come across, not because we wish it was so, but because God says it's so. I meet a surprising amount of people who struggle with identity, who struggle to believe that God loves them, who aren't convinced that other people could love them, and who aren't sure even if they can love themselves. And and as I I, I think about this, I found myself just wondering if these opening chapters of Genesis are a story we need to tell more frequently and with greater imagination in ways that not only engage the mind, but that move and capture our hearts. The space we inhabit is holy. Holy. The time we've been given is sanctified. And I think I already said it, but that makes each moment that we live filled with God-honoring possibilities. And it's not because we say this about ourselves. It's because God says this about us. Let's wrap up. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for the reminder of... (laughs) that you would get up close, almost dirty, as you craft and as you create those who you invite to bear your image, to tell your story, to represent you in their care of creation and as we interact with each other. Father, it's a powerful privilege. It's easy to forget where we come from and who we are. Father, may the words that you speak over us, very good, much loved, be words that sink and penetrate into our hearts. Not so that we know more, but so that as we head from here, we have a greater sense of imagination for how we can live into our identity that you've given us with, into our responsibility in our world, and with each other. Thank you for your grace, of course, that meets us in all those places where we remain broken. (laughs) Continue to do that work of recreating in us so that your story can better take up residence there and be told through us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.